Good, uh, good afternoon. And uh, let me welcome you all to this uh, lecture, to this public lecture on uh, governance and structural transformation for sustainable development in Africa. So uh, I must say that uh, this lecture is organized by the Economic Development and Wellbeing Research Group, which is uh, part of the School of Economics. So here at the University of uh, Johannesburg. But I just thought that uh, perhaps uh, briefly before I introduce the speaker to you, I thought that uh, it is always important to briefly say something about um, uh, this um, research group, which is an initiative in the School of Economics aimed at um, encouraging research for both uh, staff members, emerging researchers, and uh, postgraduate students. And uh, I must also mention that uh, the School of Economics here at the University of Johannesburg is one of the largest uh, in South Africa. And uh, basically, probably we can say in Africa, and um, it is a school that is offering a bachelor's degree in economics and econometrics, honors degree in economics and econometrics. And I think I must say one of the unique feature of our school is that um, we have several specialized degrees. Uh, these degrees, specialized master's degrees, these master's degrees are in financial engineering, development economics, uh, local economic development, competition regulation and economic development, industrial policy, and uh, I think I mentioned financial engineering and of course economics. Uh, those are several specialized master's degrees. And we also offer the degree of the highest order, which is, which is a PhD in economics, as well as a PhD in econometrics. There are also specializations in uh, PhDs where we specialize in uh, industrial policies, as well as innovation and development. And we also have several research centers um, that play a role of uh, linking us with the industry. We have a center for competition regulation and economic development, which is uh, dealing with uh, competition issues. And uh, we also have uh, the one for local economic development, which is focusing on local economic development issues. Uh, we also have um, the one for public economics and environmental research group, basically on public economic issues and uh, environmental research issues. So those centers play a role in ensuring that what we offer here is very much relevant to the industry. And uh, we also have uh, two uh, such chairs that are affiliated to the School of Economics. One is an in, in industrial policy and the other one is focusing on innovation and development. Uh, and in terms of um, staff complements, we are one of the diverse school where we have people from all corners of the globe and uh, our staff members publish in uh, respected journals. And uh, this is one of, um, we believe that um, I think after today's lecture, some uh, collaboration could actually be, potential collaboration could be formed. And uh, that is briefly about the School of Economics here at the University of Johannesburg. Now, it is now time for me to introduce the speaker for today. I have been warned not to talk too much because I'm not a presenter. I will be brief. Our speaker is Professor Simplis Asongu. And uh, Professor Simplis Asongu, is, um, he holds a PhD from Oxford Brookes University in the United Kingdom and is currently the lead economist and director of the African Governance and Development Institute based in Yaoundé, Cameroon. And more importantly, this I need to emphasize, he is a distinguished visiting professor at the School of Economics here at the University of Johannesburg and a lead economist and a director of the um, European Extra Mile Center for African Studies. I'm just mentioning am among others. He is a senior fellow, research fellow at the African Growth Institute, which is based in here in uh, Cape Town. And uh, super, he supervised PhD student at several universities, among others, Covenant University in Nigeria, University of Ghana, um, Antioch University um, in Los Angeles, 
and uh, Midland State University in Zimbabwe. He supervised also for Mancosa, which is based in South Africa. He's a research associate at the Research Network Africa, based in Gaborone, Botswana, University of South Africa, University of Bear in Cameroon, as well as uh, his alma mater, uh, Uni Oxford Brooks University uh, in the UK. He is an associate editor of several leading journals, among others, Journal of uh, Economic Surveys, Technological Forecasting and Social Change, Journal of African Business, uh, African Journal of Economic and Management Studies. I must say, um, Professor Asongu is a scholar of note who has published extensively in several respected journals. Hence, if you look at uh, research papers in economics, the RIPEC ranking, he is number two on the African continent. Number two, not, num not I'm talking about number two on the African continent. If you look at RIPEC Africa ranking, and globally, he is among the top 10% of leading authors or publishers, leading authors, Globally, among the 10%, I think when I was looking at global RIPEC ranking, I think he was around, um, I think 50 something. Yes, that is really a significant achievement. And we are very happy to have Professor Asongu as one of our distinguished visiting professor. He is making a contribution to the University of Johannesburg and um, basically globally. And uh, today's topic is on governance and structural transformation for sustainable development in Africa. And uh, just to make sure that I don't end up being like the presenter, it is now over to you, Professor Asongu, to deliver your lecture. We are all looking forward to your presentation, thank you, and over to you. Oh, before before I give the floor to him, I think we normally have about forty minutes to for presentation, and the remaining twenty minutes for questions and answers. And then I think I suggest that um, we 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 allow the presenter to deliver the lecture, and then at the end of the presentation, we then ask questions. Unless if there is really a very very burning issue that you can't wait. Uh, for the presenter uh, to finish the presentation. Over to you, Asong, Professor Asong. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Aita, for the very uh, brilliant uh, you know, uh, presentation. I welcome any interruptions during the presentation. I am more than welcome to take uh, questions and comments uh, while I'm presenting. Your Excellencies, Honorable Lecturers and Professors, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. When I was asked to present the paper to the Economic Development and Wellbeing Research Group and the School of Economics online seminar series, I thought it wiser to instead discuss some ideas surrounding Africa's economic development that are consistent with the overall theme of the online series. I put this suggestion to Professor Aita and Dr. Biase. We had a meeting and agreed that a public lecture on the ideas would be more worthwhile. The ideas and proposals in this presentation are not from any specific paper, but from my own experience as an African scholar. I will be making the presentation on governance and structural transformation for sustainable development in Africa. The next slide, please. Uh, so the presentation would actually uh, center around six main themes. There will be a conceptual clarification that is actually worthwhile in order to understand the uh, paradigms that will be proposed um, along the lines. I would also discuss some contemporary debates on uh, development in the world and then reconcile them within the remit of African-centric uh, paradigms. I would also propose some maximum self-reliance uh, paradigms for sustainable economic transformation in Africa as well as engage how economic structures can be financed uh, for uh, better governance. I'll conclude with some policy recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as far as uh, conceptual clarifications are uh, uh, concerned, you have three main concepts of governance here that should be uh, clearly defined. Uh, governance uh, from the perspective of my presentation entails three main dimensions, political, economic and institutional governance. Political governance uh, can be defined as the election and replacement of political leaders, understood in terms of political stability and voice and accountability. Economic governance is the election and replacement, you know, economic governance is the formulation and implementation of policies that deliver public commodities, proxied by government effectiveness and regulatory quality. Institutional governance is understood as the respect by the state and citizens of institutions that govern interactions between them. It is defined in terms of corruption control and uh, the rule of law. Structural transformation is uh, the transition from low, product low productivity and level intensive economic act activities to higher productivity and skilled intensive um, economic activities. It is, it is also worthwhile to um, substantiate what uh, the concept of sustainable development um, is all about. Within the remit of this presentation, Sustainable development can be understood as includes inclusive and sustained growth. That is for inclusive growth to be sustainable, it should be sustained. And for sustained growth to be sustainable, it must uh, be inclusive. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. So here um, we have um, the two main paradigms of economic um, a, 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 a development. This is a multipolar, a multipolar world, so that there are other paradigms, but I am focusing uh, specifically on the Washington Consensus, which is uh, summarized uh, in terms of uh, WC and the Beijing model BM. So the Washington Consensus can be simply defined as uh, liberal democracy, ca private capitalism, and priority in political rights. Whereas uh, the Beijing model can be understood in terms of de-inversized democracy, state capitalism, and priority in economic rights. So um, a distinguishing feature between these uh, two models is whether we are more concerned about the right to vote or the right to food. The right to food here being economic rights and the right to vote being political rights. The Washington consensus uh, puts priority on uh, the rights to uh, vote, whereas the Beijing model is more concerned about uh, the rights to uh, food, that is economic rights. So which is more end endogenous here? For the Washington consensus, economic rights are more endogenous because political rights come first. In other words, economic structures are more endogenous because political governance should precede economic structures. Whereas for the Beijing model, political rights are more endogenous because economic rights should um, come first. It is also important to note that uh, Political rights here, which is articulated very much by the Washington Consensus, is simply a dimension of political um, a governance. Uh, oftentimes, proponents of the Washington Consensus conflate uh, voice and accountability with uh, political governance, whereas you also have a dimension of political stability, which is not much taken into account. I am very much of the opinion that within the dimension of political governance, political stability is more worthwhile for economic development and growth uh, compared to voice and accountability. This is the situation in Singapore, in uh, China, and to some extent, Rwanda. It was also the case in, uh, Lib in Libya before the ouster of uh, the late uh, Colonel Muhammad Gaddafi in 2011. Uh, the next slide, please. So um, having clarified or having articulated the two main uh, development um, paradigms, that is the Washington Consensus and the Beijing model. It is also important to narrow down these uh, paradigms within the, um, uh, within the context of um, Africa by looking at them within the remit of African-centric paradigms. An example is uh, the uh, new partnership for Africa's uh, development, which is um, the African Union's economic development program for Africa. It actually articulates uh, human rights as well as African sovereignty. That is, the Nepal is an African we want based on maximum self reliance. It focuses on human rights, uh, which is articulated by the Washington Consensus. Now, there is also a dimension of African sovereignty, which, is arti which it articulates, which is very much, you know, uh, um, uh, um, surrounds this notion of the Beijing. 
a model. So we may say that the NEDPAD is a reconciliation of the Washington consensus and the Beijing model, because it has some dimensions of the Washington consensus as well as it, some dimensions of the uh, Beijing uh, model. Put in other words, there are complex issues of right here at play. The Washington consensus is for human rights, whereas the Beijing model is more about national rights. The Washington consensus is for idiosyncratic rights, whereas the Beijing model is much more for um, sovereign rights. So the NEPAD englobes these two main dimensions. And the reconciliation we want to um, propose is that in Africa, we need a sustainable middle class in order to reconcile this Beijing model and the Washington consensus. In other words, we need to prioritize economic institutions at the early stages of industrialization. That is, at the early stages of industrialization, political uh, economic rights should be pri pri prioritized over political rights. That is, political rights should come after economic rights. Whereas at uh, the later stages of industrialization, political institutions should be prioritized. This is essentially because it's only when there is a burgeoning middle class that people can sustainably demand political rights. As long as people are poor, they are more concerned about the right to vote than the right to uh, vote. So um, if you've ever asked yourself if votes will put food on the table, if votes if vote will uh, pay your, your hospital bills, if votes will you know, put a roof over your head, then you're more concerned with economic rights than uh, with uh, political rights. Uh, the, the next slide, please. So, there are three main concepts underlying this uh, paradigm of maximum self-reliance that we are proposing. We have responsibility, discipline, and confidence. And uh, I can I articulate this by uh, using an eloquent example, which is a recent uh, African continental free trade area that was founded in March 2018. And, uh, became effective in May 2019. As a matter of fact, the AFCFTA is an ambitious trade pact to form the world's largest free trade area by creating a single uh, market for goods and services for almost 1.3 billion people across Africa. It also aims to deepen economic integration within the continent. And this can be further facilitated by um, a common currency uh, a union. We all know the circumstances that led to uh, the creation of the AFCFTA. Uh, amid uh, some discouragement, the African African um, leaders actually took bold steps to uh, set the agenda rolling. Now, as far as self-reliance on sustainable development is uh, concerned, it is important to note that developed countries have their own issues, and they will not be funding African projects uh, for uh, forever. Hence, foreign aid is not sustainable. Domestic resource dependence leads to better governance, uh, not least because um, people are prepared to pay more taxes only in exchange for better governance standards. So in a situation where an economy relies less on development assistance and more on uh, taxes, governance is bound to be more effective at delivering uh, public commodities because people would only be ready to pay more taxes exclusively if uh, the, the, the um, uh, if 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 the government in place is uh, you know uh, also prepared to formulate and implement policies that uh, deliver better um, public uh, commodities the sustainable and self-reliant paradigm that we are proposing is also consistent with agenda 2063 because uh, agenda 2063 is a blueprint uh, and master plan for transforming Africa into a global powerhouse of the future. It is the continent's strategic framework that, it, that aims to deliver on its goal for inclusive and sustainable uh, development. I repeat, inclusive and sustainable development. And it, it is also a concrete manifestation of the Pan-African drive for unity, self-determination, freedom, progress, and collective prosperity pursued under Pan-Africanism and African Renaissance. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, the uh, par paradigm of maximum self-reliance, which we are proposing, could also be understood in terms of uh, the, the, that these are some protocols that should be taken into account when understanding uh, the paradigm that we are proposing. 
it is starting a future away from an international aid, uh, less dependence on the export of raw materials. That is, we should learn to transform our own raw materials for an added value. Uh, more investment in education infrastructure and uh, skills are what one. Uh, more foreign investment and domestic revenue mobilization. And um, there are also, there is also a need for a sustainable development partnership that will be espoused by each country as a sustainable development goal financing um, roadmap. The next slide, please. So, um, so far we have been proposing a paradigm of maximum service reliance. It is also essential to understand this uh, paradigm within the remit of models, economic development models that have been proposed and uh, used in uh, textbooks and uh, scientific papers. And there's an orbiting dichotomy here. Uh, are we for foreign aid or are we to fight illicit capital flight? Because it all centers around financing. So um, I'll discuss two main uh, models that have underpinned the need for uh, foreign aid and foreign uh, resources in Africa. We have the Harold Doma model, which is, um, which is fundamentally based on missing aggregate savings. Uh, we don't save enough. And because we don't save enough, uh, foreign aid is needed. External, uh, res external um, financial resources are needed to actually fund the uh, investment uh, gap. So we are proposing that if we find illicit capital flight, this illicit capital flight will restore the savings, savings engender investment, investment come with taxation, and people are only prepared to pay taxes in exchange for better governance standards. Reliance on domestic resources, reliance on domestic resources through taxation would, would actually lead to better governance standards for sustainable development. I will also highlight the solo um, swan model, which is essentially based on uh, catch up. Developing countries having to catch up with uh, more with their more developed counterparts, and for this to happen, uh, they have to grow um, much more faster. There is an upward bias in endogenous um, GDP in the model. Now, you can actually address this upward bias by uh, fighting illicit capital flight. This, when you fight illicit capital flight. Uh, this will lead to higher per capita GDP, which will engender more taxation. Taxation will bring about better governance standards because people are only prepared to pay more taxes in exchange for better governance. So uh, what we're trying to propose here is that instead of focusing more on it, if we were to focus more on illicit capital flight, we will be addressing most of the financing issues or that we have in the continent that are relevant for uh, understanding why we are not moving towards uh, the most uh, sustainable uh, uh, development goals. Because you have, you have, a, you have a paper by uh, Bikaba, Nkube, and uh, Briozova that was published in 2017, which actually concludes that uh, unless we address these financing issues, most uh, sub-Saharan African countries are unlikely to achieve uh, most uh, sustainable development goals by uh, 2030. Uh, the next slide, please. So um, here, I would want to engage a dichotomy so that uh, the audience uh, understands what I'm putting across. And I would also complement this with an anecdote from the World Bank. Uh, the PKT uh, Capital in the 21st cent uh, Century, this is a paper by PKT uh, published in 2014. It actually concludes that when the return on capital is higher than the growth rate, inequality is bound to uh, grow. And that because inequality is bound to grow, the poor cannot catch up with the rich. I repeat, when the return on capital is higher than the growth rate, inequality is bound to increase. And consequently, the poor will not catch up with the rich. He proposes as ideal solution, progressive income taxation, targeting the return on capital. I repeat, targeting the return on capital based on an automatic exchange of bank information. So in the light of all these uh, developments that I've made so far, what we are proposing is that, um, or what we say, because we just want to follow the, uh, the, the, the logic proposed by uh, Piketty. If the return on political economy is, is higher than the growth rate, there is bound to be asymmetric uh, development. By return on political economy here, we are making allusion to illicit capital flight. 
if the rate of illicit capital flight is higher than, than the growth rate, there is bound to be asymmetric development. By asymmetric development, we are making allusion to the fact that the rich will, the developed countries will always be developed, whereas uh, uh, poor, poor countries will always be poor. So in the presence of asymmetric uh, development, Africa can never catch up with the West. So an ideal solution should also be to fight illicit capital flight that is focusing on the return of political economy based on an automatic exchange of bank information. This will help, in, this will help to promote uh, domestic taxation, which is relevant for uh, better governance standards. Uh, the, the next slide, please. So, so no, go to the preceding slide because this is the conclusion. Go to the preceding slide, please. Uh, just the anecdote from uh, the World Bank. In uh, February 2020, um, the World Bank, after much hesitation, published a study on elite capture of foreign aid. The study now appears in the Journal of Political Economy. It, it was published in 2022, volume 130, issue two, pages 388 to 425. So the title is Elite Capture of Foreign Aid, Evidence from Offshore Bank Accounts. So the paper actually documents that aid disbursements to highly aid dependent countries coincide with sharp increases in bank deposits in offshore financial centers, known for bank secrecy and private wealth management, and not in other financial centers. So here we are informed that some of the aid that is actually uh, sent to Africa and some developing countries actually is siphoned and deposited in tax havens. This is the RPE we are talking about. So, if I uh, ju ju just an example to uh, you know to 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 to, to be more uh, down to it, some estimates have it that for every dollar that uh, gets into the African continent, ten dollars leave the continent. Some other estimates are more uh, pes pessimistic in that for every dollar that gets in, twenty dollars uh, um, leaves the uh, continent. So if we assume that the rate of uh, illicit capital flight is about three or four times greater than the economic growth rate, then Africa, and we also assume that most of these illicit capital flight is deposited in tax havens that are based in the West or that are located in the West, then uh, thinking that Africa would catch up with the West is just a dream. So instead of looking, focusing on aid, we should be more concerned about uh, addressing issues that are relevant to capital flight as a means of restoring our own domestic uh, means of financing our e economies. Another anecdote uh, that is uh, worthwhile to understand uh, the paradigm we are proposing is a paper that was published uh, by UBank in 2012. It is titled Taxation, Political Accountability and Foreign Aid, Lessons from Somaliland. It actually, it, the study actually received the uh, best paper award from the Journal of Development Studies in 2012. Now, uh, that study actually shows how a country that is ineligible for official development assistance has one of the highest or the best standards of governance in Africa. This is Somaliland. So countries can actually do with, without foreign aid and still be associated with governance standards good governance standards that are relevant for sustainable uh, development if they rely, even if they rely exclusively on domestic uh, uh, um, so, so, uh, on domestic source so, so of funding, which, um, which is the case actually in uh, Somaliland at, at the moment. I would conclude uh, the uh, next slide, please. So in, in uh, summary, um, what we are proposing is that uh, Economic governance should be prioritized at the initial stages of industrialization, which is uh, the case of most African countries. And that there should be a shift to more self-reliance development uh, paradigms, just as uh, some of those we have proposed. There should be less foreign aid and more domestic resource mobilization because uh, people are only prepared to pay taxes in exchange for better governance standards. Um, there should, the, 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 the core economic structures in the economy should be uh, managed by uh, domestic investors are not by foreign investors in, in order to limit um, uh, capital flight. I would like to thank the Economic Development and uh, Wellbeing Research Group and the School of Economics of the University of Johannesburg uh, for this uh, opportunity of sharing some ideas that are relevant for Africa's economic development.
I also very much appreciate uh, the constructive dialogues I have had with uh, Professor Aiton and Dr. Biase and uh, Dr. Kirsten for the public lecture to be uh, for this public lecture to be worldwide. I am now open to your questions and comments. I don't know if I've been brief, but I think I've uh, I've, I've I've tried to be as explicit as as, as explicit and clear as uh, possible. If you have any any concerns, I'm ready to take them without hesitation. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Thank you, Prof. I think let's open the floor now for questions. Um, um, I'll see you in the chat box and then also yeah, if someone wants to unmute themselves and then they want to ask a question. I would just like to ask the first question, if that's OK. Um, I know Prof said something also about uh, the dependence on foreign aid and then the transition of Africa to more self-sustainable development. But I just want to know um, from Prof's model, how does the, the whole debate regarding the de-dollarization come into play and the expansion of BRICS? Because I think that is so important, um, given Africa's reliance on the West, maybe uh, are we substituting it for a reliance on maybe other developing countries uh, that with the expansion of the West? Because I, I've read articles where people say Africa is almost stuck in the middle between this fight uh, between the West and uh, the BRICS nations. And I just think that is this very um, interesting concept to maybe bring into, into this discussion. And then I would like, yeah, if Prof has a response to that, and I'll just maybe open the floor if there's one or two more questions, or Prof can answer that one, and then we'll see further questions. Okay. Uh, can I take can I take yes. take a question? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Prof can take. Uh, we we understand that uh, the BRICS is currently uh, you know being expanded in terms yeah. both in terms of mem membership and in terms of ideology. Yeah. And at the moment, it is projected that uh, by 20 to 25, the BRICS will constitute about 30% of global GDP, whereas uh, the G7 will constitute just about 29%. Yeah. So in terms of GDP, the BRICS is already you know, um, somewhat, um, uh, has, it, 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 yeah, yeah, already has a substantial role to play in the global e e economy. Now, uh, the move by the BRICS to create a common currency is another fundamental development. And at the moment, the difference between the BRICS and Western nations or the G7 to be more specific is that uh, the BRICS has the resources, whereas the G7 has the finances. Okay? So if the BRICS is able to, 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 to like launch a common currency, that is backed by you know, more intrinsic values like gold, like natural resources, like rare uh, uh, metals, the BRICS would be you know, in a position to dominate in terms of finance and resources and will become the leading player in the global economy. Uh, that is what uh, Western nations may want to avoid. But the civet here is that uh, three of the three BRICS nations actually have uh, nuclear weapons. You know, you have uh, Russia, China, and India, which have nuclear weapons, which means that the BRICS project of a common currency is bound to succeed because uh, it will not um, be victim of uh, the uh, of, of Colonel Gaddafi's uh, gold dinner project, which did not succeed because uh, you know he was not militarily uh, uh, powerful. So. Uh, what the, what Africa? Because the BRICS here, we are we are we are talking about we are just talking of Africa being involved. Now, what can um, Africans actually learn from this uh, a project? They need to have you know common policies, common economic and monetary policies that are bound to project an atmosphere of unity. Uh, let me illustrate this with an example. The ECO, the ECO project that was uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, to be launched in 2020 was actually torpedoed by Emmanuel Macron and uh, President uh, Ouattara in December 2019. After the announcement in December 2019 that uh, the six, uh, that the eight uh, French-speaking uh, uh, companies were going to adopt the ECO or were going to replace the France CFA uh, with the ECO in January 2020, 
The other six uh, ECOWAS nations, mostly consisting of Anglophone uh, and countries, were very annoyed because it was contrary to a plan that had been set about six months ago. And we had um, uh, uh, President Nana Akufuado affirming that uh, his country was ready to join the ECO, but not in the terms that were laid out by uh, President um, Manuel, Emmanuel Macron and Ouattara. Uh, we also know that in January 2020, the six Anglophone countries, or um, you have Ghana, you have uh, Liberia, you have uh, Nigeria and Sierra Leone, they issued a joint statement denouncing Macron's uh, uh, and Ouattara's uh, program. In January 2020, the Nigerian president, Mohamed Buhari, then uh, tweeted that uh, French-speaking countries' decision to create a new common currency unilaterally implied a lack of trust in other ECOWAS partners and in indicated that his country, which accounts for about 70% of um, uh, ECOWAS gross domestic product, will not join. So, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, we have to be more united, both in uh, terms of this Pan-Africanist agenda, even if we have short-run cause in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, national pride. And this should go with Francophone countries, understanding that they cannot uh, eternally um, uh, prefer monetary, monetary uh, uh, dependence to uh, monetary experience. So uh, I don't know if I've responded to the yes. issue, but if there's uh, another concern I would, um, related to that, I'm ready to uh, take it. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Prof. Dad. Thank you very much. Uh, I see there's a few more hands. Uh, Dr. Biasi, then Prof. Nagepa, and then Santos Bila in that order. Um. Well, thank you so much again, uh, <clears throat> Prof. Sunwoo, for such a wonderful and, um, you know, very insightful presentation. Uh, just one question. I mean, um, I, I understand from your presentation that, you know, um, you know, there, there are some issues you feel that need to be addressed, you know, but I wondered whether, or at least I wondered what you think about institutions, you know, that maybe some of the issues uh, that we face could be easily resolved by just dealing with, you know, um, institutions, you know, in, 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 in our continent, you know, and that maybe more than 50% of the problems that we have could be attributed to that other than other, I mean, I'm not saying other issues are not important, but could be attributed to um, issues relating to institutions. Thank you. Can I add to Dr. Biasa thread before Prof responds? Yes, yes, you can, Santos. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. I mean, I, I also wanted to uh, focus on, on exactly on the same issue Dr. Biasa, you know, asked, you know, but in addition to that, uh, Prof, what do you think, because I mean, even if we are able to mobilize like internal resources, what do you think about the challenge of, you know, public finance management, right? Because I mean, even if you are able to, to mobilize fund, you know, right, internally, if, you know, people are not managing like, you know, the way it's supposed to be, you know, it's still not going to yield the expected results. So what do you think about that? The other thing is, you know, the G20 and, G and G7, like discussions nowadays that, you know, they are emphasizing on the power of moving together, right? Even to address these climate change problems. The question is in Africa, particularly, who must take the lead, right? Who must take the ownership? Because uh, unless we, we sleep and think about this, unless we, we assume this is a problem, right? Someone has to take the leadership and so on. And thank you very much. I mean, I had another one, but I can, for the interest of time, I can ask this like later on. Prof, I'm not sure if you want to respond to that and then we'll take no, Prof. Prof. I, I, very much, I very much appreciate the opportunity to respond. I'll take the last, uh, uh, the last uh, question or concern that is compared to the G7 nations uh, who should take the lead in Africa. In the recent um, uh, public uh, discussion by Professor Obama, so, sorry, by President William William Ruto of uh, Kenya, he was saying that um, when you have an Africa Russia summit, you have 54 heads of states that uh, are required to be present in Russia for 
and and you have each head of state giving 1.5 minutes as about uh, 90 seconds uh, to you know say whatever he needs from Russia for his uh, the country and that they have this when you equally have the same meeting in the United States you have about 50 heads of states running to Washington and each giving a minute to make a presentation of how his country you know of what his country needs you know in, in the arrangement but he was saying that there will be a tripartite arrangement such that uh, when any entity wants to meet the African uh, wants to meet the African uh, Union, they will send three representatives who would speak in the name of Africa. So uh, it is important that this development is important because pre um, previously other countries have been having you know an Africa policy. But now, when a few representatives are actually to represent Africa, Africa will be having policies towards this, these other countries. For instance, if we are talking about China, China has an African policy. But if China has a summit with uh, Africa and we have 50, 54 African head of states in um, China, Africa will not be having a Chinese uh, policy. But if you send two or three representatives, they will be going with one voice. And there is a likelihood that Africa will be having a Chinese a policy. So in summary, there is an improvement in terms of who would now speak for Africa. You will not be having many voices speaking, you know, uh, you know, singing different songs, songs that are mostly idiosyncratic, but we will be having, you know, a few uh, people talking in the name of the entire African uh, continent. Then coming to the question of um, uh, Dr. Bison on whether we should just focus on institutions. Um, it is a very complex and much dimensional issue. But from the presentation, we are actually articulating that when we rely more on domestic resources, the governments are only too aware of the fact that if they are exclusively reliant on these domestic resources and they do not provide worldwide public commodities, they will be voted out of power. So we are of the opinion that if these governments rely exclusively on taxes, on domestic resources, people are only prepared to contribute towards these domestic resources if in exchange for better governance standards. So this is the only uh, the, um, uh, the only hypothesis. We know that, that um, there are other issues like uh, public finance uh, management, which uh, the professor alluded to, and uh, these things can be solved, you know, by people holding uh, the government uh, accountable, either by means of you know voting them out of power, or by means of uh, going to the streets as uh, you know of, of 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 seizing power, you know, by military means as it is the case in Guinea, Burkina Faso, and uh, Mali. So, uh, in summary, the paradigm that we are proposing, uh, the paradigm has its own short, short, short comments. But the main assumption is that when people pay their taxes, they are out to see if the money they have actually paid in terms of taxes is well spent. And if the money is not well spent, they will actually find a means of holding these governments accountable whether by democratic means or by siding with the military to oust uh, the, 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 uh, the um, uh, government in place. Thank you very much, Prof. I think, uh, Prof. Sinagepa, I see your hand was raised already a while, so the floor is now yours for your question or questions. Thanks, uh, thanks Prof. Sango. I hope you are doing well. Um, I wasn't actually going to attend this, but uh, I, I had other commitments, but the title compared me to attend. Uh, I came late. Um, this is a very important point that you are making with this uh, paper, and I'm hoping that you have the paper out. Um, the paper is uh, making a case for uh, the preference for domestic resources as opposed to foreign resources, and that is underscored by um, the many debates around the developmental impact of foreign aids that has been for a while. The fact that foreign aid issues are still 
occurring, although it's been researched for a long while, is because of this, th these issues. And um, actually in February, I was at the African Union meeting and uh, I'm saying this because um, these views, I don't know how we need to articulate them. I was there and Professor Jeffrey Sachs was there too. I think he was the, the special economist invited for that meeting. And uh, with, to all these African leaders, his recommendation was that Africa should go for more debts to finance education. I agreed with him on the point of financing education, but I actually took the floor and uh, challenged that uh, we should refocus our attention on illicit financial flows as opposed to indebtedness and, and foreign aids. Um, a few people agree to that, but I think I, I wonder if uh, because debt is still very appealing in, to many African leaders because it's a cheap way of making money, uh, sacrificing the next generation. But my my fear is that platform to speak it because I don't really see many African economies being put at the center of issues of African development. Uh, uh, when uh, a, a, a prominent economist like Jeffrey Sachs made that point, I was quite shocked because uh, first, we've not forgotten uh, the heavily indebted poor countries initiative program, how it came about. And we've not forgotten that even after that, the post COVID uh, debt levels are unsustainably high in Africa. And that is a point. Now, uh, my issue now that I'm putting on the table is that we we need to move quickly, not just to make a case for illicit financial flows and um, blocking, uh, blocking those holes to be able to keep Africa's resources in Africa, but also to really dissect the political economy of illicit financial flows. There are two players, there are public players and there are private players in illicit financial flows. Uh, we need to actually come up with a model through which this works in order to propose measures to actually curb them. I think that that will be a step further uh, to this research in terms of models that can show that um, a kind of political economy back gain that can make African resources remain in Africa. Yes, there's corruption in Africa, but why is it that most African resources when the, the flow is by the public officials, it goes and sits in Europe. And when it sits, it doesn't sit idle. It, it is working, it's doing some, some so it, it's generating proceeds. So that is what I'm putting forward to you that um, we need to do more in this area and put forward models that will propose solutions to how, what kind of bargain, what kind of um, uh, 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 compact should be put in place to be able to to curb the illicit, illicit financial flow itself. Uh, I think I would uh, stop here. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, Professor Ingep, Ingep I just, uh, just a quick comment. We are on the same wavelength. Uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Saab proposes that you propose fighting illicit, 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 illicit capital flight. Uh, that is why I say we are um, on the same uh, wavelength. Now, when we go abroad for credit, when we are net creditors to the rest of the world, there's a problem, we are stupid. So you're absolutely correct. You see, if we should fight illicit capital flight, there will be no need for us overly relying, overly relying on external debt for, uh, to finance our uh, you know, domestic activities. The next question, please. I can see uh, uh, Sandilia Mbata as a question. Yes, thank you, Fat. can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Kinye. Okay, um, my question to Prof is that um, firstly, I do agree with him um, with the concept of moving away from aid towards fine, fighting illicit financial flows or capital flight, as you call it. But I wanted to ask about the safety aspect of it. I think, for example, you made an example with um, Gaddafi that when he tried to build um, to fight the US, the dollar, and um, using gold, that um, he was weak militarily and he was defeated. I think there is a case also in the in Burkina Faso where Thomas Sangara had actually fought explicitly and even spoke in the African Union that Africa must move away from aid and get self reliant strategies. 
which include illicit financial flow. I think what happened after that is that um, 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 France pulled back and funded one of people, one of the guerrilla armies in Burkina Faso to defeat him. So my point is that um, is it necessary for Africa to establish um, security institutions or joint military programs if we are to embark on, on, on such programs of like moving away from aid to fighting illicit financial flows? Because my understanding of it is that if you do that, the West and their corporations are definitely going to fight back violently in certain instances. Is there a need for us to maybe create institutions that will protect our leaders who are championing um, those initiatives? Thank you. Um, so um, thank you, Professor Mbata. Uh, actually, uh, the question, if I have, if I have understood it well, uh, centers on understanding how, if Africa proposes a common currency, how it can it can back this common currency by means of a military uh, might. Now, um, it is valuable worthwhile to understand that the United States has been printing its dollar out of thin air. And it has maintained the US dollar as international, as a main international currency reserve, simply because of its military might. Now, Colonel Gaddafi, which you alluded to at the beginning of your comment, was unable to actually materialize, materialize his gold dinner project because he is not, he, Libya was not a military super, superpower. Uh, unlike the, uh, the, the, the current situation of the BRICS, in which you have uh, three nuclear superpowers. That is, you have three countries in the BRICS with nuclear weapons. So if they go ahead with this their common currency project, that will be backed by intrinsic values and not just printed out of thin air. It is very unlikely that the West will be able to like uh, torpedo the agenda. So um, in a nutshell, if Africa is to engage in a, in a similar project, there is bound to be a country within Africa that is, you know, uh, that has a substantial military might to deter these Western um, nations in case they want to use, you know, their military might to like uh, disturb the agenda. I may propose that these African countries come together and think of, you know, having nuclear weapons as well, because this is the only deterrent. This is the only, if, if, if um, today a country like North Korea, which is nothing in terms of GDP, which is, I would even say useless in terms of a, a GDP. If the United States is afraid of North Korea, it is simply because it has nuclear weapons. So nuclear capability is an indispensable deterrent to you know, any Western hegemonic agenda. So in a nutshell, there should be a common currency agenda but this common currency agenda should equally be backed by a military agenda in order to like, uh, um, um, serve as a deterrent uh, for Western nations. Because people often say that, you know, uh, Africa, that Western countries are for Africa's industrialization, but I don't, think, I don't think so, because it is not in the interest of Western nations for Africa to industrialize. An eloquent example is the manner in which Washington is behaving towards a Beijing. Beijing is using the same rules, I would say, in inverted commas, almost the same rules of competitive free trade to, you know, uh, 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 to, 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 to increase its um, commercial uh, surpluses. Now, when you, when, 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 when you look at uh, the United States response, it is simply concerned about the fact that China would overthrow her as the world's economic superpower, irrespective of the means. So this is another warning signal for African nations that when they start growing economically by means of a common currency um, area, by means of the African con continental free trade area, there will be obvious threats from the USA and other Western, West, West, um, Western powers. And the only known deterrent that can uh, prevent these uh, Western powers from you know, uh, uh, um, having agendas that are not consistent with this um, African uh, with this African economic plan is a nuclear weapon. Yeah. So Africans should come together and uh, think of having a nuclear weapon. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are running out of time. I just want to say, I think, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any more burning questions, but uh, I just want to say and take this opportunity to thank Professor Ngu. I think this was a, really a brilliant um, discussion and presentation and public lecture. We really appreciate and we're honored to have Prof here in the online public lecture. I think it's such a, a big um, topic and I think it's such an important topic given the power shifts in the world and um, everything happening in the world at the moment. I think it, this is so vital and pan-Africanization is so important. And I just wanna say thank you for that. We really appreciate Prof's insight. Um, we are all really grateful for this. And I'd just like to open the floor now if anyone wants to show their appreciation uh, before we close the session. Thank, thank you so much, Professor Ngu. Um, I think we can see uh... Uh, electronic round of applause, you know, um, uh, uh, which kind of, you know, uh, in a way proves, you know, how grateful we are of this uh, presentation. Um, Prof. Ata, I don't know if you want to also add a few words. Of, uh, yes, I think I just wanted to say we see um, some um, OIR a round of applause. And uh, this is just to, I think uh, it's really a, a demonstration of the appreciation for your presentation on this very, very important uh, research area of um, governance and structural transformation uh, for sustainable development in Africa. And I think the way that you did it, you did it in such a way that everyone is able to, uh, to follow uh, your presentation so, and I think um, we know that you are mainly, all your research papers have econometric modeling, but I think uh, this one, you did it in such a way that you simplified the analysis so that everyone can follow. And uh, for that reason, we thank you. And um, you can see, it's not surprising that uh, Professor Songu is rated by RIPEC number two in Africa and among the top 10 uh, percent of leading authors in the world. Uh, and that's why you were able to, you see, you, you, you presented it, I think within half an hour, and that actually gave us enough time to have a discussion on issues that are affecting Africa. Uh, really, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I would like to then conclude the session. Again, thank you very much, Professor Sanko. I just want to ask uh, if it's fine if colleagues request the slides, but I can share the, share the slides with them. Um, just wanted to your approval on that. Yes, fine. fine. Yeah, you can, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Have a great and productive day further. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending this online public lecture hosted by the EDWRG and School of Economics. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.